Now, look at this this passage. He says not only that he will make a covenant that he's made a covenant to do his people good, but look at and I want to use a word here very loosely. Look at the attitude of God. I know it's, or the disposition of God in doing his people good. Look what he says. He says, verse forty one of chapter thirty two. I will rejoice over them to do them good. Do you see that? Now, this is the language of a bridegroom with his bride. This is the language. I don't, a lot of you young guys aren't married, but about the happiest moment of your life is going to be after you get married. The fact that you've entered into a relationship with, you're just so excited. You just know, you know, you run into a wall. You don't even know what to do. You're so happy. And that's good. You ought to be. The problem in the church today is not too much passion. It's a lack thereof. All these dead holy people, they just, they're boring. <laughs> but this just passion, I mean, whoa! That's right. <laughs> Amen. At least, at least there's one that's alive here this morning. But it's like, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Man, preacher, get through this thing. Get the wedding over. No, I'm not going to the reception. Jump in the car. I'm gone. <laughs> I can't wait. God's going, I can't wait. Man, what are you going to do today, Lord? I'm going to do my people good. I'm going to do them good. I'm going to do them good. Oh, yeah, sure. I could go out there and create another couple of gajillion universes. Oh, yeah, I could sit here all day and talk to you angels. I'm going to do my people good. Can't wait. I rejoice over that. It brings delight to my heart to do my people good. And most of God's people almost think that God grudgingly does it because He's entered into some contract to do it. No, He rejoices to do it. And that is so exciting to me. And it's not He rejoices to do it to Charles Spurgeon or to Mary Slester of Calabar or to Amy Carmichael or to Brother Elliot or to John Piper, but to His people and to the lowliest and most humble of His people, He rejoices more to do them good. Why? More glory. All of eternity, remember this, all of eternity will be nothing but God lavishing His riches upon your head so that all the angels in heaven stand there every day, if you could say something about glory, every exceeding, every passing day in glory, He will, re- he will heap upon your head greater and a greater degree of blessing and the angels will fall into greater and greater heights of adoration because of the goodness He has shown to you. But, let me ask you a question. Does eternal life begin when you die? Or does it begin the moment you are born again? And this demonstration that God seeks to give, does He seek to give it only to glorified saints made perfect? Or does it start now? It starts now. It starts now. It starts the moment you believe. It starts lavishing upon you. Anything that I am, I may not be much, but anything that I am, any bless, it's just a product of God's goodness. That's all it is. That's all it is. And the sad thing about it is, I have not more because I ask not for more. He rejoices to do you good. He rejoices to do you good. He's excited about doing you good. 
So many people down through the ages, even up to today, have almost spent their entire lives seeking the favor of some earthly king. Men who have taken care of an ancient relative only because they hope somehow that an inheritance will be left to them. Men who have given everything just to get into the presence of someone with power in hopes that somehow they might be blessed. And yet the very King of glory has made an everlasting covenant to rejoice over you in doing you good. Now, why is He so concerned with this? Well, you can say for His own glory, and I appreciate that because that is true, but be very, very careful. Be very careful with that statement. Because He also does it because He is love. He is love. One of the problems that I have, and I don't have many, but one of the dangers, especially of young men talking about God doing everything for His glory, is that if you don't see the whole... You see, if you emphasize even that, if you emphasize anything about God as the greatest thing, you're probably going to get off the mark. Because God's just too big to be brought into. This is everything it's all about. The fact of the matter is, God does everything for His own glory. Tis true, tis true. We'll spend a lifetime rejoicing in that and in eternity doing the same. But He not only saves you because He wants to get some glory for Himself, He saves you because He really does love you and He really does love you for this reason. He's decided to. And He is love. It's not just something He wants to express. As a matter of fact, the only reason God wants to express love is because it is what He is. It's not something He just decides either. He is love. And He is love in absolutely everything He does. You see, especially Reformed guys, It's like, you know, all these covenants and things, and they're all, there's a lot of that that's so important and so true, and, and because of this, God does this, and all these different legal and forensic things, and they're all true. I spoke about them last night. But be very careful. You turn this into almost a politic. He is love, and He loves you. He rejoices over you. This is not just about making a promise that He's going to keep. This is because He really does. Do you think it's hard for Him to keep that promise? That's a question I I like to ask people. Do you think He's made this promise and it's a hard thing for Him to keep? Well, look at me. How could it not be? He's not looking at you. He's looking at Christ and His finished work that's really real. And it's not a hard thing to keep. In the same way that for a believer, a true believer that's been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, the commandments of God are not a burden to him. One of the reasons, not just that he's just a new creature, it's just that he has a love in him for God. God's commandments are not a burden to us. God's promises are not a burden to him. He freely makes them because of love. He's freely able to love because of the cross of Jesus Christ, which is a perfect work. So, if you're going to understand prayer, you have to believe something. God is willing to do you good. God has promised to do you good. And more than that, God rejoices over you to do you good.